Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to a very special episode of Scared to Death, Creeps and Peepers. I'm Dan. Hey, Dan. It's me, Lindsay. Hello. Hi. Happy, happy one-year show anniversary. Oh, my God. What a fun ride it's been. Here we are. Here we are. Here we are. I love that we get to do this show together. I still I love trying to scare you. <laughs> I still love trying to scare you. I, I love that you t- like to scare me. <laughs> Actually, I think that I've handled things quite well. You have. You have. It was bumpy for a while in the beginning, and then you've acclimated, and you've done great. True. And uh, yeah, it's so fun. We have a very big show for you today. Uh, real quick, got some new and silly stuff in the store at badmagicmerch.com. You have two different uh, scared to death bandanas. See all kinds of people wearing those now. Mm-hmm. Uh, a little more fashionable than some of the masks, like very uh, dystopian chic, I was Ooh, thinking. Ooh, look at you with your big words. <laughs> also, uh, some hilarious keychains and coin purses. One of the keychains says, don't be a Darren. Uh, another one says, get the fuck out. Uh, I'm super excited about those items because mm-hmm. they're like kind of like retro y vintage. They're mm-hmm. like the hotel. Key, yeah, like a, like key an chain. Ace Hotel or something. Like, yep, like uh-huh. retro hotel. And then also like the little coin purses. Mm-hmm. I legit already have one of those from yeah. 50s Diner in LA. Yep. They're so cute. <laughs> Scope them out. And uh, and now it is story time. I know you have three stories. I do have three stories. I also have three stories for the first time. Yay, big episode. Big episode. Uh, going to start in America and then head to Romania and Serbia hmm. and then head to Italy to finish. Okay. Well, that's, that's All interesting because I have a stateside story okay. and then I have a story, um, that came from the UK, but mm-hmm. the author of the story mm-hmm. is Muslim. Okay. And so it's like very, to me, it was totally different than other things that I've oh, explored. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then I have a, another one to button it up at the end. I'm thinking of the uh, uh, the gin. Is it? Is it? A, oh, is there any? I can't tell okay, you. Okay, uh, the first story uh, I have is a legend of Missouri Zombie Road, uh, home to numerous tales of shadow sightings and more. Cool. Then we'll explore the legends that gave rise to Dracula and explore the Strigoi of the Carpathian Mountains of southeastern Europe. Okay. The undead bloodsuckers villagers worried about long before Bram Stoker ever wrote a word about any vampires. And then it's off to just outside the small Italian village of Cortanova to look into Italy's Villa de Vecchi. An abandoned mansion rumored to be one of Italy's most haunted buildings. Yeek. Okay, you ready for our first tale? Um, just real quick. Yeah. Um, could you, could I borrow your pen? I, my, you can. My matching turquoise pen is missing, so oh, I can't boy. take notes. And also, for this anniversary episode, mm-hmm. I bought myself a new pair of crystal socks. Well, good for you. Check these babies out. Don't mind me, I have a dress on. Can you guys <laughs> see those? Over the, over the crystal skull cake? Mm-hmm. Well, I bought these for myself. Yeah, that is a badass. I'm excited for our little celebratory cake at the end. It looks incredible. That's yeah. skull. You guys, that, that entire thing is edible. Even the <laughs> crystals. Uh, if you live in the Coeur d'Alene, Spokane area, mm-hmm. pastries and more, ask for Amanda. And we'll have to get pictures up for Instagram and Facebook so listeners can see what we're talking about here. That's yeah, so cool. At Scared to Death Podcast. Okay. Okay, let's do it, Dan. First tale, uh, driving west out of St. Louis at night. It takes about 40 miles to begin to leave the twinkling lights of one of America's top 20 largest metro areas behind you. Once you do leave those lights behind, darkness can settle in real quick. Just a moment ago, you were surrounded by endless shops and other souls, but now, looking at around you, everything feels eerily quiet and sometimes downright foreboding as sprawling suburbs give way to dark forests, rivers, and the area's many caves. As you pass a bend in the Merrimack River, maybe you glance down and see a deep and dark road leading out into the wilderness and sense that something strange and unnatural lives out there. Perhaps many such things. You wouldn't be the first person to feel this. Far from it. The road you just passed has been called Zombie Road since at least the 1950s. No one knows exactly who gave the road its unofficial name, but I do know that the road has been home to a lot more alleged paranormal activity than most gloomy and winding country lanes. Legends have been passed around for decades about sightings of spectral American Indians and Confederate rebels, packs of child ghosts, the tortured souls of working men killed in nearby industrial accidents, and more. Over the years, the area has built up a strong reputation as a place where shadowy figures and other non-human entities have long been reported to dwell. 
Originally built in the 1860s, when the area was nothing more than unincorporated wilderness with a few homesteads scattered across its rolling hills, Zombie Road was officially named Lawler Ford Road, and it ran between the railroad tracks and the river. Shrouded mostly in shadow by dense clusters of trees, the road passed through an area once called Glencoe, a resort community of small houses built along the river, houses that would largely be abandoned almost a century later. Time now for the tale of the ghosts of Zombie Road. It wouldn't take long for Zombie Road to experience its first documented tragedy. Though many have claimed to hear the singing and shouting of the men who built the railroad at night, there's no official record of any railroad workers dying at the site. Not that it couldn't have happened. There are, however, records of a young woman in 1876 being hit by a train and dying instantly. And many wonder if that young woman still haunts the woods around Zombie Road. They claim to hear her scream, and then hear that scream abruptly cut short as a phantom train runs her down in death as it once did in life. A less documented but often told tale comes from the end of 1957. That New Year's Eve, a young woman was getting ready for a party. She lived in the very last occupied house in Zombie Road. The community of Glencoe had been almost entirely abandoned in the 1940s. She put on her dress and was applying makeup in the bathroom when something suddenly felt off. She hadn't taken a shower that evening and hadn't heard anyone else taking a shower either, yet the bathroom mirror was fogged as though someone had just left the bathroom. While she tried to make sense of the steamed mirror, she wiped the condensation away and began to apply her eyeliner and mascara. And then, out of the corner of her eye, she caught a glimpse of movement. It came from the bathroom window, just a few feet away. When she saw it, her breath caught in her chest. On the bathroom window, another strange spot of condensation had appeared, growing and shrinking and growing and shrinking rhythmically. Oh, gosh. She screamed and dropped her makeup when she discovered the source of the steam. Behind the window was the pale face of a man she'd never seen before. His face almost seemed translucent. His features were soft, almost blurred somehow. But his stare was direct and intense. Within moments, her brother and a friend had burst into the bathroom to find her crying. They asked her what had happened and she struggled to point a finger at the window. Her brother and the friend also saw the same strange pale face. Oh, dang. Thinking he was a peeping Tom spying on their sister, they rushed out to confront the intruder. On the way, the girl's brother picked up a loose brick from the front patio, and then both boys ran around the side of the house and saw him. They saw a meager, decrepit old man, standing motionless, staring into the light of the bathroom window. The boy shouted, and he didn't react. A moment later, the brother was just seconds away from smashing the brick into the man's head when he suddenly stopped himself. Something wasn't right about any of this. Why didn't the man react to them when they saw him through the window? He didn't react to the sounds of them running out of the house either. And he didn't even flinch when someone raised up a brick to smash him in the head. Was he ill? Catatonic? Eyes open, lights on, but nobody home? He did seem awake, awake but just not present. His steady breath continued to fog up the window as he stared inside, seemingly oblivious to the world around him. Disturbed, the brother sent in his friend to call 911. When his friend ran around the back of the house a minute later to tell him that the police were on their way, the brother took his eyes off the man for just a moment, and when he looked back, the old man was gone. I knew it! The two boys ran back inside and grabbed a pair of rifles and then jetted back outside and searched the perimeter of the house. Not only did they not find him or hear him out in the brush, they also couldn't find any footprints in the thick blanket of snow that covered the entire property. (sighs) And that was the only time they ever saw him. The ghost of the old man never returned At least they never saw him return. Who knows who visits us when we sleep? A few months later in 1958, the family followed the trend their former neighbors started the previous decade and moved away, leaving the area directly around Zombie Road completely deserted. In the decades that followed, Zombie Road became the place where teenagers would park their cars and hang out away from the prying eyes of adults, and more strange sightings began to be whispered about and shared. During the 1960s, a couple in their late teens were on top of some adjacent bluffs overlooking the road below when the young man somehow lost his footing and quickly met an especially gruesome end. On the way down, his face got caught in the fork of a small tree growing out from the side of the bluff, and this fork literally ripped his skin Uh -uh, off. uh -uh, uh -uh. Most of his face and scalp remained on the tree while the rest of him fell dead down on the road below. Oh my god! And ever since, reports of a mangled, floating, bloody face have come from the woods around and above Zombie Road. Well, yeah. There have also been lots of reports of shadow people on or near the road. 
Several dark visitors, or some, excuse me, several different visitors have reported seeing something dark in the corner of their vision following them on the road that is now a trail. When they turn around, they generally don't see anything. But one night, just a few years ago, Avery did see something. Several somethings. Growing up in the St. Louis area, he'd heard the stories about Zombie Road and like many people was curious if there was anything actually to them. When some of his friends texted him about going to do some ghost hunting out on Zombie Road one night, he was excited to join them. Dumb. But he had to work and wouldn't be able to make it out there until a little after midnight, a good two hours after they wanted to start checking things out. He told them to go on up there without him and he'd find them once he got there. He drove to Zombie Road and parked his car about half an hour past midnight. He was surprised to see that there weren't any other cars parked in the area. Uh-huh. Had he gotten the day wrong? Had they already left and forgotten to tell him? Avery shot off a group text, and when he didn't hear back right away, he decided to wait around a few more minutes. Cell reception wasn't great along certain parts of the trail. Maybe they just hadn't gotten his message yet. He put in his earbuds and played some tunes, chilling out after a long shift at the end of a long week. And that was when he saw something moving around out in the trees. For a split second, he thought it must be his friends. And then he reminded himself that their car was missing. Mm -hmm. So why would they be headed towards this parking lot? Uh huh. He turned down his music and squinted. What was out there in the brush? Some kind of animal? Suddenly he could see a dark, moving shape. He couldn't figure out what it was. A bear, maybe? He'd never seen a bear himself in Missouri, but he'd heard they were around. No, it couldn't be. Whatever it was, it wasn't moving like a bear. It wasn't moving like any sort of wild animal. It wasn't moving like any sort of creature he could think of, period. So what the hell was it? Whatever this thing was, as opposed to walking, it seemed to almost be floating, a dark mist pushing itself through the woods. And it felt like this mist was somehow aware of him, watching him. Then suddenly an unbelievably loud noise arrived without warning, startling Avery into slamming his head into the driver's side window. The sounds of screaming filled his ears, agonized shrieking. It was so loud he covered his ears. Where was it coming from? What would make it stop? Avery ripped out his earbuds and realized the sound was coming from his phone. Something had gone haywire. In his gut, he knew this was no tech problem. It was related to the shadow in the woods somehow. Someone somewhere was begging for help. Hesitantly, he put one earbud up to his ears and heard a low female voice rasp, help us, please, help us. Then the sound cut short. His phone, which had been almost fully charged just a moment ago, had just died. Avery was done waiting for his friends. Something strange was going on and he had no interest in trying to figure out what it was alone. He put his car in reverse and as he backed up, shooting gravel into the brush in front of him, he spotted a second dark shape. He could see a humanoid figure standing on a nearby bridge, just a few feet away from the streetlight. Avery knew that at such a short distance, he should be able to make out more of the thing's features, but he couldn't. The person seemed like they were made up of nothing but darkness, made up of the same stuff he saw in the brush. He looked back into the woods where he'd just seen that black mist moments ago. Now it's nowhere to be seen, and Avery didn't like that one bit. He quickly scanned the area around the parking lot. He couldn't find it anywhere. Having backed out far enough to turn around and head back out the way he'd come in, Avery threw his car into drive while simultaneously looking back under the streetlight. Just go, just go, just go. The dark figure no longer standing there. Then he heard the screaming again coming from the earbuds, how his phone was completely dead. Laying on the passenger seat, they should have automatically disconnected from his phone, his earbuds. They shouldn't even be, uh, you know, on if the battery was working. But they, but they were, and a scream loud enough to blow out their speakers was pouring out of them. Avery pressed the gas hard, sped towards the highway that led back to St. Louis. Looking in his rearview mirror, he saw several dark figures moving around in the woods near the parking lot. Aye, aye, aye. And he swore he'd never return to Zombie Road. Adding substantially to the surrealness of this entire experience, the next day, Avery sent his friends some angry texts about standing him up. Why hadn't they gotten back to him? Why did they, um, you know, agree to meet him at Zombie Road and then didn't show up? He claims that they had no idea what he was talking about, that they never texted him anything about Zombie Road. What? When he looked into his text history, he suddenly couldn't find the messages he knew they'd <gasps> sent him. Avery now and forever is a believer in the lore that surrounds Zombie Road. The place is so creepy, even many non-believers have no interest in visiting Zombie Road at night. Even skeptics describe the road as at least claustrophobic. They say it seems like it also never feels like the same length twice. A trick of the imagination? Or are the shadowy entities Avery saw lurking about disorienting you, getting into your mind so you can't remember which way you came from and which way you were going? Do they want you to get lost and join them? In 2010, the road was repaved and rechristened Rock Hollow Trail, a gated 2.3-mile nature trail. Despite the rebranding, many still know it as Zombie Road. 
There are still reports of strange sights and sounds along the trail, and it remains a popular place for trespassing in spite of signs that warn of fines up to $1,000 for anyone caught on the trail after dark. Ghost hunters continue to sneak into the area, hoping to encounter something that takes them from being merely curious to being a believer. Eek. I had, I had to cover that hand up. This hand freaks me out. Can you guys so see So realistic it? looking, yeah, for the uh, YouTube viewers. Uh, Can you move it over by you? I hate that thing. <laughs> yeah, this uh, very realistic prop, severed arm. Yikes. Yikes. Yeah. He just, it just, <laughs> mm-hmm. it kind of like it jiggles. Yeah. And so I'm it's like, oh life-like. God, it's alive. It's alive. Here's a few pictures. Uh, here's this first one is Sunset. At Zombie Road. I mean, it's pretty, but also eerie. I know. I was just going to say, I'm like, oh, it's brush. so beautiful, but also there's something about that mm-hmm. that I inherently bump against. That that kind of part of the country, like part of the Midwest, like the Ozarks and the surrounding area where like just the brush is so thick. Yeah. Always kind of weirds me out just uh, having grown up, you know, near the woods, but grown up near like kind of almost like a, like a high desert, very mm-hmm. arid climate and with all the pine trees and then the, and then the pine needles kill kind of the chance for a lot of brush to grow underneath them. Sure. So it's real open. Yeah, I know what you mean. And, and that's so thick out there. Yeah. It yeah. just adds to the spookiness. Um, this is a, a photo of, a, of an old railroad bridge laying along the trail. I can see how that would freak you out at night. They're uh, in Cleveland, where, uh-huh. where I'm from, in case, in case you're new. Yep. Uh, there is the Metro Park system. Yeah. And, you know, it's just like this beautiful, like, green belt kind of situation. But... Uh, Every so often in certain parts of town, there'll be these old railroad bridges. Like I'm thinking of one, I think it's in okay. like Berea or North Olmstead. And during the day, it's all fine yeah. and well. But at night, it's terrifying because it's like a car and either like only one car can go at a time. And so there's like headlights out right. in, across the bridge. And you're like, are they going to go? Am I going to go? It's like a weird game of chicken. And <laughs> right. Sometimes there's like horn honking like, hey, you go. I... That whole situation. Also, if you look deep into that yeah i mean i don't know what you see but i feel like i see something at the end of that tunnel like i like, just see darkness where like the tracks meet the, yeah the yeah. open where mm-hmm. it almost looks like white on either side yeah like the the gravel uh-huh uh-huh but i feel like there's something back there no maybe, thank you maybe, maybe there is right. uh one Next, more please. one more <laughs> picture these are some hikers it is a popular hiking trail these are a lot of people that went on some kind of like a um, charity 5k walk or something that's cool bro I think it's from The Walking Dead. That is from The Walking Dead. (laughs) Uh, And again, those pictures posted on IG and Facebook. uh, Scared to death. At scared to death. I think the cool kids call it Insta. Insta. Posted on Insta. Okay. And the the book. And the book of face. No one says that. I know. No one says that. No one says that. (laughs) Our our son might say that to be weird, but that's not a thing. In fact, he's so cool, he doesn't even have Facebook. Sweet. When he was allowed to get social media, Mm -hmm. he was like, I just want Twitter because he loves politics Mm -hmm. and Insta. Insta. Insta, bro. Um, Okay. Did, Did something in that forest text our little friend to get him out there, to lure him out there? Like our little, who are you talking about? The guy in the story. Oh, oh, you were, I, I, didn't, I thought you were referencing something. I was like, our little friend. Who's our little friend? Oh, yeah, maybe. I mean, who knows? Who knows? Well, I mean, it that's, wasn't that's... in his text thread. <laughs> right. And his friends are like, no, we didn't do that. Right. So that's... how else does that happen? Well, I mean, if, you, if, if what he says is true, then some something manipulated uh, his, uh, his phone to, to lure him out there to do God knows what. I never worry about my phone being possessed, but now. Now you got another thing to be afraid of. I mean, I have so many things. That's the real goal of the show, just to add to that list. Just a running list, growing total of things to be afraid of. Early on, I got this mm-hmm. email, and I don't think the person realized that... They, they clearly weren't listening when I said, like, when you email info, you're emailing me. Because mm-hmm. it was very like, hey, whoever gets this was like, oh, I mean, if we just listen to Lindsay, we'll never do anything again. Oh, I can't go there. Oh, I can't do this. I'm like, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the whole show, is me being afraid to do anything and everything ever again. I think it's funny they felt the need to email that. Oh, yeah. Well, you should see some of the... <laughs> some, some fun emails. But anyways, but I, that just like, as soon as I said like, oh, like that's... Phones are out. Okay. <laughs> I'm back to flip phones. Okay. Normally have a sponsor break here. Not yet today, though. Not yet. Yay. No, let's let's uh, do it after this next story. Let's dive into another one. Okay. Uh, our first vampire-related scared-to-death tale. Yeek. Uh, let's talk about the Strigoi of Romania and Serbia's southern Carpathian Mountains. Uh, Google Translate will tell you that Strigoi is Romanian for ghost, but that translation doesn't quite do it justice. Vampire feels more appropriate to me. Without the Strigoi, pronounced closer to Strigoi 
in Romania, but more commonly pronounced as Strigoi in English, uh, we would have no modern vampire tales. Romanian folklore has two versions of the monster that would greatly influence the creation of the fictional Western vampire, the Strigoi and the Moroi. Moroi translates to something close to poltergeist. Yeek. But these creatures seem to me to be closer to like vampiric minions. Uh, for many in Romania, these creatures are far from fiction. The Strigoi are believed to be the troubled souls of the dead rising from the grave in physical form to feast upon the living. There are many different types of Strigoi, and some can transform into an animal. Think of like Dracula turning into a bat. Some can become invisible. Think of the classic Hollywood vampiric trait of a vampire having no reflection. Mm -hmm. And of course, Strigoi are thought to drain the lives of their victims via draining them of their blood. Doesn't get much more vampiric than that. Mm -hmm. The Strigoi are thought to be an immortal form of vampires, the kind that don't die unless you kill them. A Maroi is a lesser type of vampire, a, a mortal vampire, sometimes referred to in modern myth as the live-born offspring of two Strigoi. And Maroi can be placed under the control of a Strigoi. A vampire Strigoi doesn't, you know, uh, have to just kill you. They can choose to bind you to their dark will. You can be their undead slave to do their murderous commands. How are Strigoi created? Ancient traditional Romanian spiritual beliefs make a clear distinction between the good dead and the evil dead. Mm -hmm. The good dead are beings whose souls are able to cross over into various worlds beyond this one where they th can then find peace. Sure. The truly evil cannot make this same journey. There is no peace to be found for them. Restless and trapped, don't point at me, restless and trapped between worlds, angry and confused, they return to inflict more pain on our world. Mm -hmm. They haunt the living. Yeah, it doesn't sound too bad. They haunt the living, <laughs> often starting with their own relatives, sweet, in the form of the Strigoi. And well, while there, <laughs> I'm I'm gonna die first, so I don't care who you haunt. <laughs> and while, and while there are while there are many different types of strigoi, the one most closely resembles that most closely resembles uh, the vampire of Western lore is a kind known roughly as the hungry one. <laughs> the hungry one devours the living, literally. The hungry one feasts upon our blood, sometimes slowly. The Strigoi aren't believed to normally confront a victim and attack them face to face. They instead feed upon them. They prey upon them over and over at night while they sleep, drain them of their blood little by little, infecting them while slowly killing them. How do you keep this from happening? How do you kill one of these Strigoi? Please tell me. The best way is to locate where its body has been buried or where it chooses to retreat during the day. Dig up its body, cut off its head, drive a stake through its heart and burn everything. As if you wouldn't be fucking arrested for that. The stake can be fire-hardened wood or silver. Silver comes up in Romanian lore as a metal with the power to kill all kinds of monsters. Mm -hmm. And while we here in the West generally laugh, laugh off such lore as nothing more than silly superstition, some in Romania today could not take these legends more seriously. Bodies are still being dug up. No way! Yep, stakes are still being driven through hearts today. And remains are still being burned. Time now for a tale of Romania's bloodthirsty undead. In 2004, the body was dug up of Petra Toma in the small Romanian village of Meritnu de Sus because he was believed to be a Strigoi. Elisabetta, a neighbor of Toma's, said they took out his heart, burnt it, and drank the ashes in a glass of water. Ugh. Toma died in December of 2003, but many of his fellow villagers feared that his body did not rest. Elisabetta said... His own sister complained that her daughter-in-law had fallen ill and that Toma was to blame. She said he had become a Strigoi, he had come back, and that something must be done. So something was done. Something straight out of a horror movie. Six local men crept into a cemetery on the edge of the village. Oh my gosh. After dark, gathered around Toma's grave, enacted an ancient Romanian ritual for destroying a Strigoi. Just before midnight, they dug up his body and first, they split his ribcage apart with a pitchfork. Then, after running the stake through his corpse, they reached into his chest cavity and removed his heart. They sprinkled the, the rest of his remains with garlic, yet another part of ancient Strigoi lore that later became associated with vampires. Mm -hmm. And they burned his heart. Once it had been reduced to nothing but embers, they put those embers in water, gave the grim cocktail to a woman who believed Toma had been attacking her, and she drank it. Another villager told a reporter that this ritual worked, that the woman's health returned. Local police arrested the men who desecrated Toma's body and charged them with illegally exhuming his corpse. They were sentenced to six months in jail, but that sentence was never enforced. An 80-year-old fellow villager, Tudor Stoika, told a British reporter, no one is bothered who did it. It's their own business. This ritual often takes place, but in secret within the family. Stoika said that the Stoika said the Strigoi have haunted Romanian nightmares for centuries. 
describing them as fiendish things, ungodly. They want to do evil. The Strigoi bring illness. They make inexplicable noises and are invisible. And of course, they drink your blood. All six men who exhumed the corpse of Petrotoma claim to have seen fresh blood around the corpse's mouth. <sighs> and this is one of many such stories. In the village of Celeru, a few miles down the road from Martino de Sus, Maria Dragomir, 76, has been a part of countless Strogoi killings. Today, Dragomir makes little bags for locals to put beneath the heads of their dead. The bags contain grain, small stones, a comb, a mirror, and an apple, a combination some believe persuades the Strogoi to lie quiet in their graves. Okay. And as much as Dragomir and other villagers worry about the Strogoi today, this fear was far greater in centuries past. Back in the 1700s, vampire hysteria was rampant in some parts of the Carpathian Mountains of Romania and neighboring Serbia. Villagers were deathly afraid of Strigoi rising from their graves to feed upon them and their loved ones. Vampires like Peter Plogojowa... Pl I tried... I practiced this name so much. Peter Plogojowitz. Plogojowitz. In 1725, in the little village of Kisolava, Serbia, Peter, a farmer, died, and if you believe legends, then came back from the dead. Three days after his death, old stories report Peter returning from his grave, appearing before his terrified son, and demanding to be fed, demanding raw flesh. His son set food outside the family home, locked the door, and undead Peter retreated back into the dark night, only to return the following evening, asking once again to be fed. The frightened son had no more to give him, and then his undead father left again, but not before giving him a threatening look and flashing a menacing smile. The next morning, the son was found dead, <gasps> with puncture wounds on his corpse and a body that had apparently been drained of blood. Ah. Over the next several days, nine more people from the same village would also be found dead, their bodies bearing similar marks. Each of these villagers appeared to have lost large amounts of blood. They also had all claimed to have dreamt of being visited by Peter shortly before their deaths. Alarmed by evidence of evil forces at work, the local parish priest wrote to a local magistrate that his village was under attack, and the magistrate passed on the news to a nearby military commander. The commander, two officers, and an executioner arrived shortly after receiving this message. Wow. And they promptly exhumed the corpses of all who had died in such a strange and ominous way. And what they found shocked everyone involved. Peter's corpse, placed in the ground weeks earlier, was exhumed first, and it was perfectly preserved. He looked as though he was just merely sleeping, and his mouth was covered in what appeared to be fresh blood. <gasps> a wooden stake was pounded into Peter's chest, and when it broke the skin, fresh blood gushed everywhere. How? Blood that should have never flowed from a body so long dead. The villagers then burned Peter's body on a pyre until it was nothing but bone and ash, and then they proceeded to move on to the bodies of Peter's victims. Once stakes had been driven through all of their hearts, they were reburied, and some garlic and whitehorn, a shrub, uh, placed on their bodies. And they were, and then no other villagers claimed to dream of Peter Plagajewicz or die from blood loss in the years that followed. And the strange tale isn't even the most infamous vampire legend from this area. In the 18th century, another more famous vampiric tale comes from Serbia, the most infamous and widely known ancient vampiric tale to come from the region and basically from the world. The following is a condensed version of the first documented case of deaths attributed to vampires by an actual doctor. Long time ago, doctor, but still. Serbia in the early 1700s, not a safe place to live. It lay between Christendom and the Islamic forces of the Ottoman Turks, and it played host to an endless streak of bloody clashes. Mm -hmm. Thousands starved as a result of constant crop destruction. Thousands more buried their dead after losing them in innumerable battles. A semblance of peace finally came to the devastated region at the dawn of the 18th century, around the city of Perichin, where Austria briefly, when Austria briefly occupied the Serbian city. Mm -hmm. The Austrians wanted Serbian Christians to resettle the war-torn town. Serbs arrived as refugees from villages still under Turkish control for the promises of parcels of land that they hoped to farm and defend. They would rather be subjugated by foreign Christians than by foreign Muslims. Amongst their number was Arnold Pauli, a man who was returning home. He'd seen extensive military action and just wanted to live peacefully back in the town where he was born and raised. He'd had enough of bloodshed, but much more would soon come to him. He had no idea that fate held a terrifying future for him and for his new neighbors. With his military experience, Arnold became a hajuk in the native village of Mediva, a freedom fighter of sorts, a Robin Hood-type figure who took from the Turkish rich to feed the Serbian poor. 
These Hajuks, these resistance fighters, attacked Ottoman strongholds and guerrilla raids. And in 1726, when Arnold was alone on one of these patrols, helping to ensure his village that it was safe from Ottoman retaliations, he would claim to be attacked, not by a Turkish warrior, but by one of the undead, by a Strigoi. He'd been stationed in a place near Kosovo when the alleged attack occurred. He told others that a Strigoi injured him in the middle of the night that he feared not just for his life, but also for his soul. Once dawn broke, he claimed that he traced the attacking Strigoi back to its grave by following its tracks, and there he exhumed the monster's body, decapitated it, and ran a stake through its heart. He also took some of its blood, smeared his own body with it. Ugh. This was another ritual believed at the time to keep from joining the Strigoi as a member of the undead, but it wouldn't work. Shortly after returning home from this attack, a terrible accident cost Arnold Pauli his life. He fell from the top of a hay wagon, broke his neck, and died instantly. He was buried in the local churchyard, but he wouldn't stay buried. He wouldn't stay dead. The Strigoi had infected him. Nearly three weeks later, a villager swore they saw Arnold late one night walking through the village. Over the next 10 days, dozens of reports of similar sightings followed. People who'd known Arnold in life testified over and over that they had seen him walking through the village in the weeks following his documented death. And then the attacks came. Uh-oh. Over the course of several days, four different people complained that Arnold Pauli had attacked them. And then these same four villagers all proceeded to fall ill. They suffered from chest pains. Their skin turned pale. They suffered from fatigue and weakness. They slipped into fevers. And within days, all of them were dead. And they weren't the only creatures in the area who were dying. Lone sheep were also turning up dead in their pastures, their bodies curiously left uneaten, bodies believed to have been drained of blood. Soon the frightened people of Med Medveda had had enough. Arnold had told him himself that he'd survived an attack by a Kosovo Strigoi. It was clear to them that he had now become one. A group of villagers met at his graveside and dug up his body, and they were horrified by what they found. Fresh blood again covered his mouth. Blood covered his clothing, and the lining of his coffin was saturated with fresh blood. How? More disturbing, his fingernails had grown substantially in death. Ugh. It all confirmed what they'd feared, that Arnold dwelled in the space between the living and the dead, that he was a monster. When they hammered the stake through his heart, they heard Arnold groan in pain, and they watched him try to rise. Uh -uh. Blood rushed from the wound. Blood poured from a body that had lain in the ground for weeks. The villagers set fire to Arnold Pauli, and soon his body was burned to nothing but ashes. But the burning, and the burning, excuse me, didn't stop with Arnold that day. The bodies of all four of the people who'd said they'd seen him after he'd turned before dying themselves were also exhumed. Their corpses given the same treatment. And then the village was quiet. <sighs> no more sightings, no more strange deaths. The curse of the Strigoi appeared to be over, but appearances can be deceiving. Five years later, in 1731, a 50-year-old woman named Malika from Medveda grew sick and died. And it would later be determined that she was the first of a new Strigoi infestation. Mm -mm. A trail of corpses would follow her death. After Malika, an 8-year-old boy fell ill and mm. died. Three more boys soon followed, a 14-year-old and two 15-year-olds. A 20-year-old woman and her 18-week-old baby died after them. Oh. A 9-year-old boy followed. And then the 30-year-old wife of another Hajuk, then a 24-year-old man a 40-year-old woman, an 18-day-old baby. All grew pale before their hearts stopped beating, all burned up with fever and suffered from weakness and fatigue. Their bodies were exhumed, and all but three of their corpses were perfectly preserved. And those corpses had fresh blood in and around their mouths. No stakes were driven through any of their hearts, no bodies were burned, their relatives protested such desecration. Soon the village would regret this decision, for more deaths would quickly follow. A 60-year-old man, a 25-year-old woman, another woman, age unknown, her eight-week-old baby. Another young woman died 15 days after waking up in the middle of the night screaming. She told her startled family that a Strigoi had been in her room. She told them it had attacked her and tried to kill her. Oh my God. She said the vampire looked exactly like one of the recent victims, someone who'd been buried just days before. Oh, boy. More bodies were exhumed. More corpses showed zero signs of decay. More of the dead had fresh blood in their mouths. Johann Flukinger a surgeon in the Austrian army who'd been sent from Vienna by the Austrian emperor to the village to make sure the deaths weren't the result of an outbreak of the plague, he took detailed notes regarding the condition of the bodies. He wrote that Milica, the first victim of this second wave of attacks, appeared quite plump, though in life she had been described as lean and dried up. Hmm. Her skin also now held a vividly red hue. To those who knew her, it looked as though she had been eating better in death than she ever had in life. For many of the bodies, Flukinger recorded that the skin on the hands and feet along with the old nails fell away and completely new nails were evident along with fresh and vivid skin. 
More disturbingly, he kept finding blood in their major organs. Not coagulated blood, as he had anticipated, but blood that was fresh and fluid. It was impossible. But there it was, the doctor was examining corpses that all showed signs of vampirism. Taking advice from local elders, the doctor had a posse of men from both the village and a local Romani camp decapitate the bodies, then engulf them in flames in a massive funeral pyre. And then, it was over. <sighs> no one else in Medveda would die from the mysterious ailment that had been killing villagers left and right in the previous weeks. Soon the story of Flukinger's vampiric findings was being relayed all across Europe. People were shocked to hear a story about a medical doctor coming to the conclusion that villagers had died from being attacked by vampires. For some, like the villagers in the first story of the Strigoi I shared, they don't think these attacks have ever stopped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this first picture... I, oh, I never considered vampires as a thing to be worried about. Yeah, because uh, the Bram Stoker, like the, the modern... It, it is interesting to me how it does come out of folklore legends mm -hmm. and that these legends are still active in certain parts of southeastern Europe. Uh, here's, a, here's a photo of the of artist's depiction of his Strigoi. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. is not what I was picturing, and I do not care for that photo. Uh, this next one, another just a vampire photo from some, some film that is Strigoi-ish. Okay, all right. He looks like he doesn't have ears or something. Mm -hmm. Not sure uh, what kind of vampire this next photo is. Those teeth are... Yeah, yeah. I'll do... This is some kind of, I don't know what's going on with these two vampires, or maybe just one. I don't know. They seem like they're having fun. Looks like a good time. Mm -hmm. Do you want to try that later? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then <laughs> this is a, this last picture is a recent kind of vampire, uh, the heartthrob vampire with super ripped abs. Who's that? Uh, one of the True Blood people. Oh, I don't know. I didn't watch it. I didn't watch that. it either. But um, Actually, that's a lie. I watched, no. Joe, my, Joe I forgot. I should have wrote his name down. He's like Joe... <laughs> Joe Paisley. No, Joe, it's Joe Paisley. Uh, Joe, it's like Montaigne or something like that. Montoya? I don't know. I don't know. I'm talking on my ass right now. What's What's the other one that, um, True Blood was the TV show, right? Mm -hmm. And then what was the... Um, Twilight. Yeah, I only yeah. watched one of those. But... Oh, okay, those those two really got like the heartthrob can of vampire going for a while. Yeah. Uh, I was excited to do a Strigoi story because I love The Strain. Uh, it's, it's a TV show aired on FX. Yeah. I watched on Amazon. Uh, adapted from Guillermo del Toro and Chuck Hogan's novels and graphic novels, which I've, I've read the books, read the graphic novels, and now I'm watching the series for the second time. Mm -hmm. My heart was like <laughs> feeling tense in that. I was like, weird. Oh, did not care for that. You want a steak driven through it? I mean, oh, yeah. oh, I guess the thing is that at that point you're dead. So, right. quite, so quite frankly, if I died and then mm -hmm. you thought I was a Strigoi, I want you. <laughs> <laughs> to go ahead and and ha let me have it. Isn't that crazy though that, that uh, still to this day in certain villages in Serbia yeah. and Romania, they're digging up bodies and they're cutting heads off. Well, I think and it's they're crazy burning hearts. That the uh, police force there, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever military or local police, police, yeah, yeah, that they're just like okay. Well, I mean, they said that they got in trouble, but the, like it sounds like yeah. a slap on the wrist. It sounds very um, what's this, uh, ceremonious, mm -hmm. but it's like yeah. You're just doing that because that's what you're supposed to do, but right. they're not really going to be. From what I read in like, uh, you know, other articles, it sounds like, you know, it's like modern Romania, modern Serbia versus kind of old Romania and old okay. Serbia where it's like, you know, you have the cities and you have the people, uh, you know, living in the more urban areas that tend to not believe in any of this. Mm -hmm. And then you have the villagers who very much believe in this. And it's like, they're like, come on, stop digging up the corpses. And so, they, you know, they have these laws. Right. And they, you know, for show are going to make some arrests. But then at the end of the day, it's like, it's their tradition. No one actually got hurt. Well, that's They were already the dead. Yeah. Why would you put them in jail? I, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think they want to like send it, like at least show uh, uh, the semblance of an arrest, though, to hopefully dissuade others from doing it. So it's not happening left and right. Right. But it sounds yeah. like it happens, but it happens maybe yeah. quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have like, you know, of course, any stats or anything, but sure. it's like. Uh, you don't have stats on digging up bodies? <laughs> in... uh, 17. 17 in 2020. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, no? I, it, it is fascinating to me. Uh, honestly, like what creeped me out the most of all of it is that when they would dig up these bodies, just the blood around the mouth mm -hmm. and like that woman was all plump with blood. I mean, they don't say that, but it's mm -hmm. definitely implied. Uh -huh. And then like the the one casket lining was like, very, right, right. I, all I could keep thinking was, but how, 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 how? So sure. if there's any doctors or scientists that want to email me and let me know how that could actually be possible posthumously. I would be interested. Mm hmm Yeah, but who knows? Who knows? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you, are you ready for the unprecedented third opening tale? Oh, my gosh. I can't believe we're going to do six stories today. <laughs> Heading to Italy 
for our final tale this week. Uh, suicide trigger alert in this one. I think this is the scariest one. Um, this one got me more than most stories have gotten me in the recent weeks. Okay. Are you uh, are you ready for it? I guess so. Uh, yeah, and, and definitely definitely some setup in this gonna, one. Yeah. Since, since we're going to be in Italy, it feels like a very religious place. I'm just going to get my hand crossed okay, out. Okay, quite but, a bit of setup, actually. So, yeah, yeah, you got time to settle. Okay, great. Thanks, Dan. Uh, less than 90 miles north of Milan, just east, just east of Italy's incredibly picturesque Lake Como, nestled, uh, nestled against the beautiful forested mountains that surround the village of Cortanova, sits a house said to be amongst Italy's most paranormally infested, Villa de Vecchi. Alternately known as the Red House, the Ghost Mansion, and the House of Witches, was built between 1854 and 1857 as the summer residence of Count Felix de Vecchi. Within just a few short years after its completion, the house would witness several tragedies that would serve as the foundation for a haunted legacy. Count Felix de Vecchi was head of the Italian National Guard and a decorated hero following Milan's liberation from Austrian rule in 1848. A well-read and widely traveled man, the Count set out to build a dream retreat for his family with the help of architect Alessandro Sedoli. Sedoli fell ill and died young a year before the villa was completed, and many would later view his death as an omen of more tragedy to come. After a second architect oversaw the home's completion, the Count and his family made Villa de Vecchi their home during the spring and summer months, and by most accounts, they led an idyllic, if brief, existence there. Set on over 32 acres of carefully manicured grounds, wow. the mansion boasts a blend of Baroque and classical Eastern styles, was outfitted with all the modern conveniences of the time, including indoor heating pipes, dumb waiters, a large-scale pressurized fountain. The walls and ceilings were decorated with painstakingly detailed frescoes and friezes, and a larger-than-life fireplace presided over the main parlor where a grand piano stood at the ready. Extensive gardens and promenades rounded out the already picturesque surroundings and an equally impressive staff house was built. And then just five years after moving in in 1862, the Count returned home one evening to find his wife brutally murdered oh. and his daughter missing. Reports don't say exactly how his wife was killed other than her face was horribly disfigured. Clearly, she'd met a brutal and bloody end. The Count began a lengthy and ultimately unsuccessful search for his daughter, and then months later, when he couldn't find her, he committed suicide at the age of only 46. Oh, that's awful. Neither his daughter nor his wife's killer were ever found. His daughter was never found. The villa was then passed on to Felix's brother, Biago, whose family and their descendants continued to live on the grounds all the way up until World War II, after which they vacated the property for good. Before the Devecis lost possession of their ancestral mansion, Occultist Alistair Crowley spent a few nights in the villa in the 1920s. And the rumors of the home being haunted seemed to start with his stay. Some think through a seance, he contacted the spirits of the original owners. And that once they returned to their home, they never left. Rumors of dark rituals, including orgies and sacrifices, both animal and human, followed in the wake of Crowley's visit. These rumors were quickly followed by new rumors of suicides, murders, and disappearances in the years around World War II. After the war, possession of the stately grounds passed quickly through a series of brief owners and prospective buyers in the years of economic collapse that followed the Second World War. By the 1960s, the property was chronically uninhabited and abandoned, and it's remained that way up until today. Graffiti now covers the home's walls. Anything capable of being vandalized has long ago been damaged, destroyed, or stolen. The grand piano, once said to be played at night by a ghostly entity, has been smashed to pieces, though some locals claim that the music can still be heard coming from the deserted house. Adding to the strange lore of the property, an avalanche in 2002 wiped out all of the nearby houses, but left the villa eerily untouched. Oh, that's weird. And in the years since, several brave or stupid paranormal explorers have claimed to have broken into the old home and stayed the night, hoping to make contact with whatever apparitions may still inhabit the dilapidated estate. And I'll end my last story of the week with one of their stories. Time now for the tale of the Lady of the Red House. Matteo da Costa, a self-proclaimed ghost hunter living in Rome, claims to have been terrorized by something in the mansion when he stayed the night uh, on what he believed to be the anniversary of the Count's wife's murder. A date he doesn't share in his account of what he alleges went down that night because he doesn't want anyone else to follow in his footprints. Matteo says he drove to the village of Cortanova and rented a room at an Airbnb for a few nights, a place that would be his base camp of sorts if things got too intense at the villa a place to run to and hide if he was found trespassing and had to leave, and a place where he can leave his car and have it not be uh, appeared to be abandoned. Matteo traveled to Cortanova alone, 
not wanting to be influenced by the overactive imaginations of any of his friends. He didn't want to think he'd heard something, only to always wonder later if someone else had made the noise. He wanted to know for certain that he was the only living soul inside the mansion, and that if he saw or heard or felt anything, he couldn't attribute it to something other than the paranormal. Sounds like an idiot. And he would get all that he hoped for and more. After making it to Cortanova late in the afternoon and dumping off some of his things at the Airbnb and grabbing dinner, he waited for nightfall, then set off with a backpack of supplies to explore the ruins of the once elegant mansion. Once inside, he used a large flashlight to search the entire home. He found some garbage left by previous trespassers, but nothing that seemed like it had been left in the past few weeks or maybe even in the past few months. Satisfied that he was indeed alone, he laid out his sleeping bag upstairs on the landing that lay at the beginning of a hallway that also overlooked the main entrance in front. The landing provided the best vantage point where you could see as much of the house as possible at one time. He lit over 30 small votive candles to both be able to see more of the home and also to detect any drafts or movement. Mateo placed the candles all over the house. He laid most of them out in rows so he could follow, for example, a breeze as it traveled from one candle to the next. He didn't lay out any cameras, no digital recorders. He wasn't interested in proving to anyone other than himself that the spirit world was real. And then he sat still and he waited in silence and he listened. And for the first first few hours, he didn't hear or see or feel anything. And then the temperature suddenly dropped. At least it seemed to occur suddenly. He'd already been wearing a light jacket. It was a cool day. And he knew that it did, of course, get colder at night. And maybe it had been getting colder for hours, but if it had, he hadn't noticed. He was completely comfortable one moment, and the next, he felt bone cold. And then a few minutes later, he could see his breath. He knew it wasn't that cold. The temperature wasn't supposed to come even close to freezing. And this cold felt wrong. He tried to stay calm and ignore the sick feeling in his stomach. He didn't want to experience anything simply because he was scared and his senses were heightened. And then he saw one of the candles. The one placed just inside the open front door began to frantically flicker. Oh boy. And then, (laughs) Jesus Christ! That scared the shit out of me. That had to have been Joe. Oh my God. God damn it, that was a good one. Oh my God. Oh my God! That's the worst I've been gotten so far in the show. I feel like I've had a heart attack. I don't even know what just happened. (sighs) Ah, candle flipped off the shelf behind. Oh my God. Okay, not having a heart attack. All right. That was, and nobody knew what story I was going to tell. That was well played, whatever that was. Oh, oh my God. Oh my God. You know, the power went out here yesterday. I know. That almost made me feel sick to my stomach. I already felt sick to my stomach. And okay. then, okay. Well, yesterday when the power went out. Right. I think oh my God. the building owner said she thinks it's the ghost. Okay. So that's fun. Okay. So the candle, so he sees one of the candles. The one place just inside the open front door began to frantically flicker. He watches it go out. Normally not a big deal in a big drafty home missing most of its doors and windows. Of course, there are good odds a candle or two will blow out. But this was unusual. It was unusual because no other candles were flickering and the air in the house felt still. Very still, in fact. Then a moment after the first candle went out, a second candle began to flicker frantically. It was the candle next in line between the door and where Mateo sat atop the stairs. After a few seconds of erratic dancing, the second candle also went dark. Again, no other candles moved even the slightest bit. Mateo could now definitely see his breath, the temperature continuing to drop. He remained quiet, tried to control his breathing to see if he could hear anything, nothing. But he could feel something. He was having the experience he'd hoped for. He knew he wasn't alone. It was incredible. Proof of some type of life beyond what we could normally see. A third candle flickered, the one he'd set at the base of the stairs. Mateo literally pinched himself to make sure he wasn't dreaming as the third candle went out. Then he heard something. Unintelligible whispering, vocal static, like someone trying to talk to you on the phone when the connection is really poor, but quieter. A fourth candle flickers halfway up the stairs, the candle less than 15 feet away. Something is heading for him. The whispering grows slightly louder. He still can't make out the words, but now he can see a shape in the darkness. He can't believe his eyes. Mateo is staring at the outline of what seems to be a woman slowly moving towards him. He grabs his flashlight, then stops before turning it on. He's scared, but he doesn't want to do anything that can end this experience with whatever this is. Another candle goes out. The shadow continues to ascend the stairs as Mateo sits and watches. It's freezing now. He begins to shiver uncontrollably. 
the candle flame no more than five feet away from him at the top of the stairs begins to quiver. And the whispering grows loud enough for him to make out the words over and over. It keeps repeating, Resta, resta con me, resta con me, pasempra. Resta, resta con me, resta con me, pasempra. Stay, stay with me, stay with me forever. Stay, stay with me, stay with me forever. Get the fuck out! The candle snuffs out. Mateo turns on his flashlight and he screams. The figure of a woman in a bloody white dress stands before him. A woman with a face that has been horrifically smashed by some kind of heavy, blunt instrument. Her cheekbones and nose completely crushed, one eye gone, the other oozing out of its socket. Her lower jaw dangles and rests against the front of her neck. Only a small thread of skin and gore keeps her from falling to the ground. Mateo drops his flashlight, runs back down the hall, away from the stairs, until he'd made it to the opening that once held a door to the bedroom furthest from the main entrance. He looks back and sees it one by one. The row of candles in front of him quickly blowing out. She's coming for him. Mateo runs to the open window, silently thanks God for the vines that have grown up to the window from the ground below. He quickly climbs out and exits the building, lowering lowering himself so swiftly he slips and falls to the ground. Not quite hard enough to break a foot or an ankle, but hard enough to have his foot slip out from under him and hit his chest and knock the wind out of himself. He rolls over and looks up and he can see the outline of the woman he'd ran from in the window above him. He watches her retreat into the house. He feels certain she's heading for the front door and that she'll leave the house and come for him again. He doesn't want to know what'll happen if she gets close. Mateo stumbles to his feet, runs back towards town with nothing but the lights of nearby homes and a half moon to guide him. He barely looks back on his way to the Airbnb. Once inside, he quickly locks all the doors behind him, turns on all the lights, excuse me, locks the door behind him, turns on the lights. He prays that night for protection. It's the first time he'd earnestly prayed since he was an altar boy years earlier before he'd stopped going to church and lost his faith. He never fell asleep that night. The next morning, once it was light, he decided to go back to Villa de Vecchi to retrieve his things. Maybe a Darren. He had two nights left on his Airbnb, but decided he'd be driving back to Rome just as soon as he grabbed his backpack and supplies after leaving the house. Although he was admittedly still feeling incredibly spooked from what had happened to him the previous night, nothing felt off when he got back to the house until he crossed the threshold and stepped inside. (sighs) He immediately noticed three things. First, it was instantly much colder than it should have been inside the house. Second, he didn't see any of the candles he had laid out the night before. What? Third, he could hear the whispering again, just barely unintelligible, like how he'd first heard it, but he knew what was being said and by whom. No, no, no. He decided to be quick, He'd just run up, grab his backpack, then run back out. Halfway up the stairs, he froze. His sleeping bag, the candles upstairs, his backpack, all gone. And the dust that lay on the floor, it looked as if some of his stuff had been dragged down the hall. Oh, God. Then the whispering grew loud enough to have the words be heard as clearly as he'd heard them the night before. Resta, resta con me, resta con me per sempre. Resta, resta con me, resta con me per sempre. Mateo turned and ran back down the stairs and out the door. He didn't look back until he was probably a hundred yards from the door. And he just looked back for a moment before turning and running again. He saw her, standing just inside the open front doorway of the Villa de Vecchi, the white dress, the unforgettable face. And then he ran back to his car and drove back to Rome. And while he's never experienced anything in the years since like he experienced in the ruins of that old mansion, he still has nightmares. Always the same dream. The candles blowing out in front of him, one by one. The whispering, resta, resta con me, resta con me, pa sempre. Stay, stay with me, stay with me forever. And then he wakes up screaming when he sees her face. That was fucking awful. Yeah. That right there. Yeah. We'll talk about what happened behind me in a second. Yeah. That story right there is exactly why I don't ever want to go ghost hunting. Because that's it. Once once you can prove it once, all of these stories become real. <laughs> that's right. become so much more terrifying. And, and then the nightmares are just never fucking ending. Yeah, I get it. I Yeah, I'm with you. What the fuck happened behind me? <laughs> that, was, that was, I am 99% sure, a prank. But holy shit, did it get me. The Some candle, one of, the, one of our candles, like, flipped off the shelf. Well, I, of course, didn't see it because it happened behind me. But I heard it. My and it, God, that got me good. I, did I scream so loud that your eardrums burst? I felt like I, I was too screamed. Busy, I was too busy screaming myself. I, I felt like I had a heart attack there. I, I feel like you might be useless in a haunted situation. <laughs> now I see like what happened. Your fight or flight's not great. Go straight to flight. Oh my lord! <laughs> now, okay, uh, uh, some picks on this. And the last one is one of the creepiest picks I've ever found. Okay, f- relating to one of the stories. Okay, first picture, uh, recent pick of the Villa de Vecchi or Vecchi. Why, Why so, is it all like reddish? 
uh, just a leftover paint or the way the paint oh, has kind okay. of, um, I don't know what the term is. Chipped away? Chipped away over the years. Might be like clay. I don't know. Okay. Um, this next one is an original picture of, of the estate and beautiful. Beautiful. A big fountain out in front. Yeah. And the manicured grounds. And then this last one is a picture that somebody claims it's a ghost in the window of the old mansion. It's circled. Okay. So if we can zoom in on this one, I mean, it is, I mean, I guess you could say it could be Photoshop. That's creepy. Can you see that outline of a lady in that window? Uh Uh-huh. I sure can. So that would not be fun. No, thanks. Yeah. No, thanks. Okay. So those were, uh, those were my three stories. My stomach hurts so bad. (laughs) Like I was already, That's a good jolt. oh man, I was already not feeling great. In We're that gonna story. cause a car accident with that one. It's good. like, like if I was listening as, as jumpy as I am, and I heard that level of scream, <laughs> we might have to put a try. warning on this episode at the beginning. Oh man, like, watch out for the scream. X amount of minutes scream, in. A scream coming. Oh my god. What's weird for me over here is, and I'm not, I'm not saying this to like exacerbate the moment. Yeah. But I swear that I felt someone grab my arm. Oh my That's God. why I was like, what is going on over here? I saw here? you weird now. I there. know. I did not care for that. It's probably Millie, who's our resident ghost. Mm-hmm. But then again, you never know. Okay. Well, that was a lot of fun. I think we should be done. <laughs> right. I like that I have three Layla's now. I know. I Okay. So they're all from three different people. That's Isn't awesome. That hilarious? That's awesome. These things smell so good. I, I actually don't care for the way they smell. Huh. All right. So Layla can be all little, yours. I got a little Layla army hiding behind this mangled arm. Oh, that arm is so gross. <laughs> and I, awesome. I, I know, but it like really grosses me out in all the right ways. Yeah. Okay. Um, my pen stopped working. Oh, <gasps> I'm worked not, again. That's weird. I kept mm-hmm. trying to, and it wasn't. So here's your pen back, Dan, in case you have notes you want to make for questions later. Great. Also, I have something else for you. What do you have? I have a little um, present for you. Yeah. For celebrating. Our first year of shows. Yeah, I do not Yee. have a present. I didn't think of it for the... This is a um, a crystal growing cactus. Oh, okay. So you can grow your own crystals. So you say for me, but really a present for yourself. No, it's for you. I want you to grow some crystals. I oh, got the cactus. so fun. I got the cactus shaped one because you're prickly and it's prickly <laughs> and... Okay. A saguaro cactus. All yeah, right. I want you to grow crystals. Oh, uh, fun. I'll, get, I'll be sure and get right on that. I do love that for our wedding anniversary this year, mm. I did give you two crystals. You did. And I see them on your desk all the time because you know you can't get rid of them because I gave them to you. Oh, man. And you know I'll ask where the hell they went. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's like getting stuff from the kids. It's like, like getting a weird gift that you don't want from the kids. Like the orange clown shoes Kyler made you? Uh-huh, and then you can never get rid of them. Never get rid of them. <laughs> wow, my heart is still, I am like, whoo. That's good. Yeah, yeah, I told yeah. You. I told you it was a good one. It was a really good one. Um... Well, I know that you said this a little bit before, but okay. I, I also wanted to just take a minute to thank you. Like, this has been so much fun. Yay. You know, I mean, yeah, it's such a, a amazing thing to be able to do a creative project mm-hmm. and have any level of success with it with your partner. Yeah. You're my best friend. Oh, you're, you're my best friend. Yeah, I love you very much. Love you too. And I'm not in an insane asylum, so I feel very much like we did it. We did it. We did it. High five, even though I can't reach you. High Boom. fives. High fives. But but for real, it is so yeah. exciting to be on this journey with everyone. I mean, yeah. you and the creeps and the peepers and our incredible team here at Bad Magic. Like, mm-hmm. I just feel so insanely grateful. Yep. And and on top of it being 2020 and it being such a shit show. No kidding. It's like an added level of gratitude. Yeah, it's been such a fun escape for us. Yeah. And so I just, you know, I know that we discussed this before the show, uh, you know, just how grateful we are and just taking that minute to reflect in it but you know it's really about the fans you know it's like we just want to say thank you to each of you who tune in each and every week for every five-star review for every piece of merchandise you've bought for every advertiser that you've heard that you've then followed through on like you guys are the show you make it possible every week and yeah i just want you to know that i love you very much thank you thank you thank you everyone yeah okay and after our final fan story today again Mm -hmm. i have three um we're just going to do like an extended little chit chat. We're going to have a little toast. We're going to yeah. cut open the skull cake. Awesome. And uh, the the team here might pop in and say hello because to you guys, they're just names. But to us, they are our family and they're what make this show possible as well. They're still just names to me. They're faceless names. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 totally. Yes, we couldn't do the show without them. Do you think that you're the worst boss ever or what? I just like to say things. I like to say it's crazy things. Uh-huh. Okay, so um, my first two stories are anonymous. Yeah. 
So I think that uh, we're just going to start right in with this possible haunting and or maybe a warning from a ghost. Ready? Okay. Okay, King Creep and Queen Peeper. I've debated sharing the story with you or actually anyone for almost 13 years, probably because I'm a huge skeptic who loves a good scare, but has never really believed in ghosties and ghoulies, but also because of what happened. It was so terrifying. My heart still races and my throat still goes dry just thinking about it. We moved into our new rental house on Halloween 2007. I know. What the fuck were we thinking, (laughs) right? We were thinking that it was a cute house, quite a bit bigger than our old one, and that our landlords were kind enough to allow us to move in early. I mean, being skeptics, we thought nothing of taking possession of a new home on the scariest day of the year. Late that afternoon, I did one final scrub down of our old house and took the last of our stuff to the new house, mostly cleaning supplies and a few plants. When I got to the new place, my husband and our five-year-old son had ran out to get pizza while I stayed behind to make our house a home. I also wanted to be around in case any early trick-or-treaters came knocking. This was my first time alone in the house, and I did... 10 out of 10, not like it. I couldn't pinpoint a particular reason I didn't like the way the house felt. It was just ominous, heavy. I chalked it up to exhaustion, an unfamiliar house, and maybe a touch of superstition about Halloween. After dinner, my husband and son went to meet new neighbors and collect peanut butter cups for me while I stayed behind to make our son's room cozy. That creepy feeling never went away. But what did I expect? I was playing spooky sounds for trick-or-treaters after all. Halloween bled into Thanksgiving, which gave way to Christmas and New Year's. Our decorations changed, but I still never felt at ease in that house. I always felt like someone was watching me. There was a constant, almost burning, cold pit in my stomach. When I asked my husband if he ever felt weirded out by the house, he said he didn't feel anything. When I described my discomfort, he assured me I was just exhausted or stressed or, you know, whatever, things going on with our kid. I don't know if our son felt like something was off, but he started having nightmares almost every night. In the mornings, he couldn't remember dreaming at all, much less waking up with night terrors. He started talking to himself when he thought I couldn't hear him. And not in that way that we all talk to ourselves like, where did I put that book kind of way. This was more conversational, as if someone was asking him questions. No, no, I I don't know. Because I'm not allowed, were the kind of conversations I would overhear. I told myself it was just my precocious child talking with his imaginary friends. At this time, my husband started to think that there was something in our vents, something that was making us sick. We started feeling, we started finding little piles of what seemed to be insulation all over the house, on our counters, on the table, and sometimes on the clothes in our closets. Even though we'd been running the heater since the day we moved in, the debris did not show up until late January. Just as he reassured me that there was no vibe, I reassured my husband that stuff falling from our vents was no big deal. Our landlords had just had a baby, and I didn't want to bother them over something as silly as a little debris from the vents. My husband remained unconvinced that it was nothing. One night, I woke up to use the bathroom. I pulled the covers off just as a car passed our window. Its head illuminated a man, not a shadow figure, a real live man. He stood at the foot of our bed on my side. He had on a bulky coat and one of those fuzzy hats with the flaps that come down over the ears, which I've always associated with hunting. He lifted and aimed a shotgun right at my head. I screamed so hard, my throat ended up burning for three days. What? What's wrong? My husband asked. Someone's in here. I croaked, tears streaming down my face. Who the fuck's here? He bellowed to the darkness and to no one at all. He jumped out of bed, flicked on the bedroom light, and everything was normal. The room was empty. It's nobody, babe. Shh, you're just having a nightmare. No, I sobbed. He was right there. I pointed to the spot at the foot of our bed. You have to check the house. He's still here. I can feel him here. Even though he didn't believe there was really a man, my husband got up and checked the entire house. Every window, every door, every closet. When he came back to bed, he held me while I cried and described the man to him in great detail. Even though his room was directly across the hall from ours, our kids somehow slept through the whole ordeal. Lucky him. I didn't sleep at all the rest of the night. Sometime after dawn, though, he had another bad dream and cried out for me. I got up and brought him to our bed, grateful to have all three of us in one place. I did not tell him about the man in the hat, the fucking man who leveled a gun at his mother's head. 
Instead, we chatted about normal shit. What to have for breakfast, whether to go to the park or the museum, his favorite Lego set. Hey, Mom. Mm Mm-hmm. Did you see that man? The world dropped out from underneath me. What man, baby? I tried and failed to keep my voice steady for my son. There. He pointed to the empty ceiling. He's looking at us, Mom. Nope, I don't see him, honey. But guess what? Time for breakfast. My husband and I had a whole conversation with just a glance as I scooped my son up and carried him to the kitchen, hoping the invisible man wouldn't follow us. I cleared heater debris off the counter and pulled out a pot for oatmeal. My husband came in just in time to see me staring at the debris in the bottom of the pot. The pot had been in a closed cupboard all night. He called our landlords the next day and asked them to figure out a way to keep the insulation from blowing all over us. They told us that it was just harmless insulation and we should just wash our stuff before using it. Convinced that shit could not pos- convinced that that shit could not possibly be harmless, my husband went up to the attic to see what he could find. Way off in a far corner, he found several bags of what had been blowing all over the house. Zonolite, Libby, Montana. A- oh, sorry. <laughs> a quick internet search taught us that Zonolite was a brand of vermis- vermicellulite. I can't even say it. Do you know how to say that word? Vermicellite, which was commonly used for insulation. The mine where these particular bags had come from in Libby, Montana, had been found to be contaminated with asbestos and was shut Mm -hmm. down. In fact, the entire damn town of Libby was a giant cloud of asbestos. Most of the websites I read said that uh, asbestos-contaminated insulation isn't necessarily a reason to panic as long as it's undisturbed and ideally covered to prevent disruption. But if it is disturbed by, say, blowing around your house and into your cookware, you're in danger of getting asbestos particles embedded in your lungs and ending up with mesothelioma, a type of lung cancer. Mm -hmm. Again, my husband called the landlords and explained all of this to them. And again, they just blew us off. The next day, I reached out to a local activist who volunteered his time and services to teach people about asbestos. He took one look at the attic and the bag my husband foolishly dragged closer and said, if that stuff was coming from our vents, we could be in serious danger. He helped me collect a sample and send it out for independent testing. Surprise! It came back with a dangerous level of asbestos. We were advised to get the fuck out and leave our shit behind because everything was contaminated. We informed our landlords of the results and asked them to release us from our lease or pay for a hotel while we have the house professionally taken care of by an abatement company. The volunteer who helped me also put me in touch with a friend from the EPA. And with one phone call, the EPA friend urged us to follow the recommendation to move and leave our stuff behind. He said he'd be happy to talk with our landlords if that would help, but still they refused to release us from the lease or even acknowledge that there was a problem. Through all of this, I didn't notice the creepy vibe unless I was home alone, which was rare. Maybe I was just preoccupied or maybe it was holding back, observing. About two weeks after that man had appeared in my bedroom, we moved into a new house. Since we were barely scraping by, we couldn't afford to buy new stuff, so we vacuumed as best as we could and hoped for the best. We left that house on a sunny day in March, and driving away, I felt a little lighter than I had in the entire four and a half months we were there. Since our landlord never tried to help and refused to let us out of our lease, I left the house keys in a kitchen cupboard right in a pile of insulation along with a copy of the test results. The man in the hat never came back. I know this sounds ridiculous, but I believe that he worked in the Libby, Montana mine before it was shut down. Maybe he even died of mesothelioma. Looking back, I believe he wasn't there to hurt us, but rather to warn us that we were in danger. What a slumlord, sir, the landlord. Right? What a piece of crap. <laughs> I mean, right. seriously. Like, you're messing with people's actual health they at that have, point. They could have sued, probably, something in that situation. Um, but you know how it is. You just want to get out. And sure, like, oh, sure, sure. And like the writer says, you know, they were... Just to ignore the EPA. Like, what are you doing? Right. But they were, you know, you know how it's like tricky when you're in a situation like that and you're already barely scraping oh, by. Oh, yeah. The no. thought of getting a lawyer is sure, just... Sure, sure. No, I get their side of it. I'm just, yeah. And, and, that, and that Libby, that, you know, that insulation is like, there was a house I lived in in my mid-20s. Yeah, mid-20s that had like the popcorn ceiling mm-hmm. in uh, Spokane. Yeah. And, you know, because of the proximity to Libby, yeah. you know, some of the older homes in this oh, area yeah. had that asbestos insulation, you know, it'd be like sprayed onto ceilings and everything, that, mm-hmm. like, yeah, that, that popcorn ceiling kind of look. And uh, I had to take it to a special place and have, you know, uh, I had to cut some of the little pieces of the popcorn ceiling off, take it in and have it tested, make sure it didn't have the asbestos. That's crazy. Yeah, luckily it didn't. Yeah. But I remember that being a big concern where it's like uh, 
there was a huge cancer problem in that area because of the asbestos. That's awful. I had never, mm-hmm. I mean, obviously I know what asbestos is and all that, but like I had yeah. never heard about that from Libby, Montana. Yeah. I've never been to Libby. It's not that far from Minnesota. Yeah. Huh. Well, another time. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, are you ready for another one? I am. Okay, so this story is totally new grounds for us, as I kind of mentioned before. It's it's oh, coming yeah. from a UK listener uh-huh. um, with a Muslim background, and honestly, I, I can't remember a single episode, but then you brought it up. Um, well, early on, we had an episode about the jinn yeah. in Oman, uh, and jinn come out of... Um, uh, I don't want to say folklore, but like, uh, like how in the in Christianity, like basically the equivalent of a demon. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I, f- more, I forgot about the jinn. Yeah. Islam, how could is, I? Islam's demons. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this story is also anonymous, and mainly because you know the religious beliefs here are so woven through this person's family that they just felt like you know yeah. not good to expose that. Uh, so the author goes on to say, "Dear Dan, Lindsay, and the whole team at Scared to Death." Hello from the UK. Hello. I'm a huge fan and have been since uh, episode two first aired. I've been hooked ever since. Humor is great. The banter is on top form. The scares give me chills. And the production values are top class. 10 out of 10. Uh, I love it. Isn't that I, so nice? I also, uh, in general, just love the way uh, not only UK people talk, uh-huh. but also write. Oh, they write as they Top speak. form. Mm-hmm. You just, it's just something, a phrase you don't hear around here. I, I like it. I appreciate being t- top form. Top form. I've recommended you to tons of friends, and now we share in spooks every week. Yes. I would say I'm definitely a creep. My friends think I'm a bit of a psychopath because (laughs) I'll listen to the podcast on my nightly runs. Uh, Oh, man. That's brave. In my defense, that fear and adrenaline do help me complete those midnight 10Ks. Oh, my God. And I'm always a little relieved when I've made it home safely. Midnight 10Ks? Uh Uh-huh. I'm a doctor. Wow. A trainee surgeon. So I'm very... Oh, man. I could not do that. Right, right. The run, like, this person is no exhausted way. from their... Um, Shift around. Yeah, what do they call it? It's like the your rounds? residency. Oh, residency, yeah. And then running 10Ks at night. Cool, no problem. <sighs> this person is a beast. Uh, uh, so it and, and goes on to say, so I'm very scientifically minded and very skeptical. Uh-huh. As a doctor in a busy inner, inner city hospital, I've seen humanity at its worst and most vulnerable. And so the normal things that tend to scare people don't really phase me. Okay. Blood and gore are my forte, and I won't even bat an eye at the horrors that walk in every night. Ugh. But the story I'm about to tell you, let's just say it got under my skin a lot. So much so that it did make me question my worldview, and I still am to this day questioning that. There will be some major DT- GTFO moments, <laughs> but it will all make sense at the end, or so I hope. I apologize for the length, but I hope it scares you as much as it still scares me. As I sit and compose this email at 2 a.m. during my lunch break, during my night shift at the hospital, it's safe to say I'm pretty damn uncomfortable. I'll not disclose the names of any of the characters of this story, nor my own, to maintain the privacy of everyone involved. This story is titled, Demons in the Bedroom. I come from a Muslim background with a belief system that is very similar to Judeo-Christian, but different in some aspects. These things are not very well known in the West, so I'll give you a brief summary about what I understand about it, but don't quote me. In the Quran, it states that God created three sentient species, human, angel, and the jinn. Man he made of clay, angels from heavenly light, and the jinn from smokeless fire. To man and the jinn, he gave the greatest gift, the gift of free will, to forge their own paths and to design their own fates. It is said that we inhabit the same world together, but in different planes of existence. In this life, the jinn can see and interact with us, but we can't with them, and then the reverse in the next life. The jinn are slightly different from demons in Judeo-Christian belief because they're a good jinn. They aren't all inherently evil. That's right, yeah. However, those who interact with humanity are those seeking to twist and exploit humans, so they are the evil jinns. The story begins 10 years ago in a leafy suburb of Birmingham in the UK, which I love Birmingham. In the house lived my uncle, a doctor, my aunt, a pharmacist, and my grandparents. My uncle and aunt were young professionals, scientifically minded, but also religious. Not in-your-face religious, just some private prayer after a long day's work, almost meditative in nature. Their spiritual beliefs and their day-to-day living almost never interacted with one another. My grandmother is the littlest, most adorable human being you'll ever meet, and my granddad is the very religious, stoic patriarch of the family. 
After a few years of marriage and buying their own first house big enough for all of them, my aunt and uncle were blessed with their first child, a baby girl we'll call S. A happy, chubby, perpetually giggling (laughs) bundle of joy that would bring a smile to anyone's face. Until the night would come. Quite early on, when she was nine months to a year old, my aunt and uncle gave her her own bedroom. Decorated for a little princess, she absolutely loved playing in that room all day. But when the night came, she was a screaming wreck. And I mean screaming. Almost every day, one of her parents would find her inconsolably crying and always pointing to a single spot, the corner of the room on top of the window. Uh. As busy young professionals, they thought nothing of it and brought her into their room so they could all get some sleep. This continued until baby S was around three and a half. And then it promptly stopped. But that was when something weird started happening instead. Little S would now spend all day in her room talking to what initially appeared to be an imaginary friend. This would often go on past bedtime when her mother and father would hear her talking and giggling after she'd been put to bed. When asked who she was talking to, she replied, I'm just talking to my friend. Playing what she thought was a game, my aunt asked, tell me about this friend. And so she replied, she is 10 years old and she wears nice dresses, but she doesn't like daddy. Not one bit. Bemused, my aunt asked, so where does this friend live? And S replied, can't you see, mommy? She lives in my room, in the corner of the room on top of the window. Uh. And points to the exact spot where she used to point to when she was crying as a baby. My aunt freezes when she says this, but as a young scientist, pushes the instinctive fears for more scientific conclusions. Putting it down to the imagination of a child, she brushes it off. She tells my uncle, and he thinks the same thing. This imaginary friend stayed for a long time, with my aunt and uncle becoming more and more concerned. S starts acting up, misbehaving, which isn't like her at all. At the same time, my aunt begins to start having some issues. Constant anxiety, feeling on edge all the time, and seeing flitting shadows in the house. She would regularly see something out of the corner of her eyes and began also suffering from severe sleep paralysis. She'd often describe the feeling of something sitting on her chest and she was unable to move. My uncle, the doctor that he is, put it down to mental health issues and tried to help as much as he could with psychological input, but none of it seemed to help. My aunt would complain of hearing voices, constantly whispering, uh, constantly hearing whispering from her daughter, her husband, and her in-laws, especially while she prayed, saying all manner of negative things about everyone, driving a wedge between her and her own family. My granddad then recalls having a very vivid dream where he felt a dark, malevolent present while sleeping. A very spiritual man, he said that he recited various prayers and refused to let the dark entity into his home. I kind of imagine Gandalf and the the Balrog. (laughs) A few days later, my aunt and S are at the front door waving goodbye to some visitors when she turns to see S looking troubled and upset. What's wrong, kiddo? My aunt asks. S replies, my friend is outside at the end of the driveway and she can't come play with me. My aunt, intrigued, asks, why can't she come in? S upset replies, she told me that granddad won't let her into our house. The scary thing is, my granddad hadn't told anyone of his dream, thinking nothing of it. When my aunt mentions it to him, he freezes in terror and starts praying like crazy. Only after that does he tell about his dream that basically shits everyone up. (laughs) Up until this point, the stoic scientists were just grasping for logical explanations for all this crazy nonsense. This had been going on for years, and they were no nearer to finding the answer. So they finally went to an imam, a Muslim priest, to get some prayers and whatnot said to them. My uncle didn't believe in it at all, and he thought if they got on with this, everyone could just move on with their lives. And boy, was he wrong. This guy deals with psychotics on a daily basis, so there really isn't much that phases him. I shit you not, this was completely different. I had never seen the man so spooked in his whole life. You could see his eyes completely change. His whole scientific paradigm had come crashing down around him, and he could not equate what was happening in his life to what his brain was telling him was possible. The priest starts doing all of his prayers in Arabic, and all of a sudden my aunt's voice completely changes, and her body language body language becomes completely aggressive. No, I won't leave her. She is mine. 
my aunt yells, thrashing and making menacing gestures to my uncle. His presence made her so agitated that he is asked to leave, leaving her with the priest and her mother only. Afterwards, he finds out that she has some entity, likely a djinn, inside her and has had it for many years. The entity is really possessive of her and is aggressively against my uncle, my grandparents, and little S. The priest gives her loads of prayers and recitations to help calm it down, but what but what's concern but what was concerned that because it had been in her for so long is it is if it was sent away she would be open to another potentially worse entity things have been settled over the past few years but she still sees flitting shadows in the house on a regular basis no one really knows what to do as scientific as i am this struck a primal nerve with me and i just can't shake it it's still happening and we'll oh, never geez. know when it will rear its scary, evil head again. Thank you so much for reading my story. Keep up the good work. Yeah. This is happening right now. I know, yeah, ongoing. And that's one of those, yeah, it is interesting from a scientific perspective because like men mental illness has obviously been considered in that situation, but what right. makes it hard to say that it's mental illness is like, is the S, uh -huh. S pointing at the corner of the room many times over a couple of years, then talking to something in that place. And then that thing seemed to be associated with her mom. Uh huh. It's just like when you add the element of the toddler, the baby, whatever, mm -hmm. it, it makes it harder to be like, oh yeah, mental illness. Right. Yeah. And, and doctor, pharmacist. <laughs> right, like, right, right. And then the, the dream that the grandfather had that he didn't right. tell anybody, but then all of a sudden the, mm. the friend is at the end of the driveway and can't come in. Like, it's just too much. Yeah, that was, that was creepy. I got the chills for sure on that one. Yeah, me too. Are you ready for one more? I am. You got it in you? I am. This, this I do. Is, this is brief, but powerful, I believe. Oh, okay. Do you remember episode 44 about evil doppelgangers? Oh, yeah. Oh, God. I, I forgot about that one until now, but that, that story freaked me the fuck out when I was putting it together. Like, I, that, I was weirded out for like a week with that one. You're about to be real fucked up. Because this story... <sighs> this that one in the mirrors uh, haunt me. Babe, I'm telling you, this one... Yeah. Proves. Proves it's real. If, if any of these stories are true, if we're going in with that thought... Okay. That it only has to be true once. If this is true, evil doppelgangers are for sure a fucking thing. No matter what you tell me, I'm going to convince myself that it's not so I can live the life I want to live. Okay, fair. Okay. My name is B, and I have a story that I had to go back and find old journals and endure long phone calls from my mother and father in order to get all the details right. This is hard. This will be long, but hopefully it's worth it, and I apologize. When I was young, everyone always mistook me for my doppelganger, including my own parents. Once, when I was about five, they saw her in the store and tried to put her back in the cart, assuming it was me, and I was done with going through the toy bin. But apparently, as I came down the aisle, they looked back to the cart, and she was gone, completely gone. It terrified my parents, but they tried to ignore it. Friends and family would comment they would see me in surprising places, always trying to talk to me, but I wouldn't interact with them. I was told that I was just staring at them and it made them very uncomfortable. This would continue up until high school. I would hear, little inter I would hear of little interactions between people I knew and my doppelganger, all until one very horrifying day. Walking home from school, she grabbed my arm so tight and pulled me back. It was me. The hair, the eyes, the what? birthmark, the clothes, everything. It was me. And she smiled at me. Uh. It was horrific to see. I remember it so clearly, like her mouth stretching the skin as she smiled. The kind of expression you'd have when you had to pretend you really didn't hate something. The anger in her eyes drawing me in. My mother found me halfway between our house and the neighbors. I had been passed out on the sidewalk and the other me was gone. I never was able to explain it then and I really still can't. I had a perfectly my-sized handprint shaped bruise on my arm. In a way, I couldn't have done it to myself. I knew, I knew it was real. Mom told me I had fainted in the heat, but she was scared. This is going to sound absolutely nuts, but she is with me now, in the mirror. I'll see her behind me, all, <sighs> always smiling, sometimes gripping my shoulder, sometimes I catch a glance of her walking past behind me, 
no matter what, she always looks like me, except for the eyes. Now, when I look at them, she seems to laugh at me. I always feel weak and tired when I look into her eyes. Imagine it's like streetlights through a rainy window, but the inverse of that. The eyes look like black holes swirling. I feel drawn into them. There are times I wonder if she's trying to take me over. What? That is so, that is so creepy. Uh -huh. I would lose my fucking mind if I saw myself in the mirror behind myself. And, and, and worse, if I, if I got touched, if I got grabbed by myself, oh, that is a nightmare. And also, what if you, like, what if Kyler and Monroe were still little and you're like, you pick up a child and put them oh, into yeah, no, your shopping no, cart. No, no, And then you turn around and you see them walking towards you and previous <sighs> child is just poof, gone. What the actual fuck? That's when I just like projectile vomit. For sure. Just out of some crazy like stress reaction. Yeah. I knew that that one would kill you. Oh, that is, oh, I don't know why. You know what? And there's something weird related where it's like the mirrors and the doppelgangers. Well, I mean, to me, it's it's, it's like the same kind of fear. And I don't know sure. why it affects me that way. We each have our thing. Mm -hmm. Well, but you, it is... you have a dirty soul. So it's probably like <laughs> when you look I'm in the mirror. I'm most afraid of myself. That's what it is. Yeah. I get that's, it. that's the psychological part of that is I'm really I'm terrified of myself because mm -hmm. I know what I think that I don't share with people. Well, I feel like I hear 99 percent of those thoughts. So <laughs> maybe you don't. Oh. Maybe the worst ones you hear are like the ones that are like medium. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> don't, I'm safe. I'm safe. Everything's OK. Ah, <laughs> uh, that was that was really good. Man, really good stories. Really good stories. Hey, Dan, I love today's episode. So good. Yeah. And you know what else I have? Some birthdays. Birthdays. Mm -hmm. People. You're, you're, birth you're the birthday fairy. Well, you know, also, I mean, pe there are a lot of people this week. And I just want to say, like, mm -hmm. wow, people were really busy nine months ago. These are, like, a lot of, like, New Year's Eve hookup babies. Oh, okay. I mean, okay. not, you, it could be your mom and dad hooking sure, up, like, whatever. Sure. But I just feel like a lot of champagne was had. <laughs> uh, and, and the other thing, mostly these birthdays, not mostly, but a lot of them, yeah. are moms and their kids watching the show together. So it was, like, requests from moms for their kids or kids for their moms. I thought right, that was right. so sweet. Here we go. Happy 16th birthday to Gabe from your mom, Amy. Yeah. Happy birthday to Phoebe from your mom, Lori. Happy birthday to Summer Rose. Also, that's Monroe's middle name, just so you know, from your mom, Cassandra. Happy birthday to Penelope from mm -hmm. your mom, Lacey. Happy birthday to Susie from your daughter, Rain. Happy birthday to Anya from your sister, Carmela. <laughs> Happy birthday to Greta from Dylan. And also, hail Nimrod Dylan. <laughs> Happy birthday to Brandy from your hubby, Ben. Happy B-Day to Aunt Brittany from your nephew, Joey. Happy birthday to Caleb from your girlfriend, Caitlin. And happy birthday to Esther from Dan and I. Esther, so happy you wrote to me to tell Aww. us that your birthday is our one-year anniversary here. Oh, yay. So that's very cool. That is very cool. Happy birthday, be cool, everybody. Be cool. I think that's what the kids say. And, and I have a big announcement that I don't want to forget here before you we do, do our cake celebration. Oh, okay. Uh, do share, Dan. <laughs> more and more of our growing body of creeps and peepers. Uh, between podcast listeners and the YouTube viewers, we have, we estimate, uh, about 150,000 creeps and peepers right now. You guys are amazing. Thank you, thank you for growing to that point. Uh, and, and many have been asking for more content. Yes. Uh, we haven't had time until now to really get, get that ready, but now right. we do. We are launching a Scared to Death Patreon account next month. We Very are. exciting. We are. You know that? Uh, there's going to be two levels, a Robert level. Based on Robert the supposedly cursed doll. Robert the doll. So and an, scary. And an Annabelle level based on, of course, the that infamous doll. Uh-huh. Roberts are going to gain access to ad-free episodes. So you have the ad-free catalog. Okay. On the Patreon feed, you'll get the entire catalog of Scared to Death, all future episodes with no ad interruptions because we know that is uh, something that bothers some people. And totally. We get it. So yeah. now there's an option for that. Very cool. Annabelle's will also gain access to ad-free episodes, plus they will get one big additional bonus Scared to Death an, an, uh, episode a month. Like, you know, today's... Uh, a show, or yeah. it could be a, a live show that we get a recording of, a, oh, a special like a on, show. Like an on location. Like an on location show. Cool. So there'll be a special Scared to Death episode each month. Um, and a shout out. You get a shout out on a Tuesday night Scared to Death episode upon signing up and a 20% merch discount for all of the merch at badmagicmerch.com, all the Scared to Death merch. Can I get that discount? Mm hmm. 
And a monthly, this looks awesome, highly stylized horror movie review that uh, Logan Keith has been putting together. We have an awesome set yeah. in the studio now. Uh, there's going to be some fan interaction built into this. So it's going to be like Very a book cool. club for movies. That's awesome. Yep. Break down movies. You see what you think. You send in your reviews as well. It's going to be a whole thing. That's so fun. And maybe some additional surprises here and there. Maybe. You mm-hmm. just don't know. We're going to make it fun. So hopefully you like it. We'll announce the uh, exact October launch date here very soon. Yes. And, and that's all for today. Instead of ending with the usual thank yous, let's celebrate. Yay! With some cake and champagne. Thanks to all of you. To everyone involved here. To all of our fans for making this show a success. A much bigger success. A year in than I would have ever suspe- expected. No, don't turn on the lights. It, it, oh, oh, he's turning on the lights. We're going to do the big thing. Okay. Let's, you, oh, look at this. We got champagne. We got the cake here. Oh we got gosh. Kate Keith coming in. We got, we we got, got Logan filming. We got Joe in the room. Wee. We got Zach. Zach Flannery in here. So weed cake. Ah, uh, the... so let's uh, let's cut this cake. Who's who's gonna cut the cake? Who's gonna? I don't think. Can you do it with the the microphone? Can I you can, can I you move cannot. around? Joe Paisley though. I'll, I'll Joe Paisley's gonna sneak I'll in here and do it. Okay. Oh, there we go. There we go. Do we do we, do we seem like Happy Birthday or something? Like, like, happy <laughs> episode. Well, you don't. Know, and, and and no one needs to listen to us eat. So we'll eat off mic. Sure, but but we can still yeah. cut the cake. But we can still cut the cake. I'm very confused. And also, a school cake. I don't I just know. Cut the jaw off? Uh, cheers, cheers, oh, yeah. cheers, everybody. Yeah. With the little skull flutes. Guys, come in. Come in. Um, Thank you. Yes. yes. <laughs> Hope this is the first of, of many years to come, Creeps and Peepers. Uh, thanks again for being uh, such a big part of this journey. Zach, come in. Come, so you, come on in here. So uh, we, we can introduce our, our awesome team. You guys can't mm-hmm. see Joe Paisley right now because, like, who cares? You can see him on Is We Dumb. You know right. what he looks like. <laughs> right. Gross. <laughs> Right. And uh, handsome. <laughs> oh shoot, gross, handsome, gross, same, handsome. same, same. Uh, cheers, yeah. everyone. Uh, congrats to year one. Yeah. Can't wait to do many more. And hope you were, of course, scared to death. I love how you just cut me off when I was trying to juice oh, our I'm whole so- team. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was uh, <laughs> caught up in the chaos. Don't. We're not ending on that scared to death. This Let is, Lindsay introduce. This is like my life 101 with Dan. Like I'll be. In case you guys hadn't noticed yet, like I'll be <laughs> really like building it up, setting okay. something up, and then you just like sweep in and you're like, God, I wish you would shut the fuck up already. Is that, and, is that our whole life? It is. <laughs> you know it is. And we're gonna end on a weird note. No, we're not. I'm going to introduce <laughs> the team. <laughs> So again, you guys all know Joe Paisley. This is the Keith. This is Kate and Logan Keith. They handle our merch. They're sometimes some of the first points of contact, uh, you know, social media posts. They are the best. The best. The best. Do you want to introduce Zach since he's mm-hmm. on your side? Zach Flannery right here who does some of the directing Yes. Uh, on Scared to Death and is a huge part of Time Suck, doing yes. the research, doing the trivia, doing the Secret Suck research. Uh, yeah, it would be very hard to do what we do here without Zach. Oh, yep, that's so nice. very, very important. Did I say mm-hmm. nice enough stuff about and, you guys? And Sophie Evans is not here, but Sophie is also a huge part of the show. You know, gathering episodes. Heather yeah. Rylander, a huge part of the show. Yeah, yeah. And Sophie and Liz Heather. Liz Hernandez, you know, yep. huge. Yeah, they're not, not not here with us. Yeah, they're all like remote, lo- mm-hmm. lo- remote location employees, but they make everything better and yeah. easier, and that allows us to make a great show. And Joe Paisley was the one who, um, you know, customized the sound beds, came up with the uh, set concept, you know, with yep. us. Uh, a lot of this set is Joe's design. All of the tech setup is Joe's design. Yep. The sound bed curation is what, you know, Joe got going. I mean, we would not have this show without Joe. Well, so. easy. <laughs> easy. No, we love Joe. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. The, whole, the camera just starts crying. <laughs> <laughs> She's like shaking a little bit. Like <laughs> uh, so thank you, everyone. And thanks uh, to everyone who listens. Is it? Now, now you can Do I have say the it. green light? Now you, cheers, everyone. Cheers, everyone. Yes. This cheers. time for real. Hope you were scared to death. Yay. <laughs> If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through but has no home here within scared to death.